All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started, guys. If you just joined the chat, thanks for being here. Um, please feel free to go ahead and enter your name, your region, the sports that you coach, and then the age group of athletes that you coach in the chat so that we can all get to know each other a little bit. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for taking part in this first Coach's Corner webinar session. We're really excited that you're all here and really excited to be offering this. Uh, my name is Jenny Montoya and I'm the volunteer manager with Special Olympics Colorado. We're really excited today to launch this new series and this will be a monthly webinar series. One of the common requests that we received from you guys, um, just in general from feedback surveys that we've sent out is that you really want more of an opportunity to connect and collaborate with one another. Um, you know, you guys are the experts in the field and you guys are out there, you have a lot to share and so um, I think at this point, it's fair to say that we all have a fair amount of screen fatigue going on. And so the, the plan is not to keep you here for hours and hours, but really just to give you an opportunity once a month to give us all an opportunity to come together, um, to share some ideas. And so there will be two parts to these webinars moving forward. The first part will be just a very brief presentation on a topic. And the second part will be um, discussion. So time to collaborate, time to break out into small groups and just kind of share some of our experiences and our ideas. Um, I know today, just on this call alone, we have coaches from all across the state. Some of you have been with us for a year and some of you have been with us for over 10 years. So regardless of how long you've been with SoCo, we are very, very happy to have you. Today we are joined by a very special guest. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to meet her yet, her name is Stephanie Levine, and she is the Athlete Leadership and Family Services Coordinator at SoCo. She will be leading our presentation today on the topic of working with Special Olympics athletes and strategies for improved learning. So Stephanie is absolutely wonderful. Those that know her already know this. And like all of you, she's a huge advocate for our athletes. She has tremendous experience working with individuals with ID. And I know that at the end of this training, she is going to share her email address. So I do encourage you guys to connect with her, um, whether it's surrounding questions related to this training or specific content um, or circumstances that arise throughout your season. She is a wonderful resource for you. So with all that being said, um, I have about 25 minutes to dive into this topic that we could probably spend hours and days discussing. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jenny. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, like Jenny said, my name is Stephanie Levine. I've been with Special Olympics Colorado for about a year. Um, prior to this, I've sort of always been within the special needs community. I was a high school special education teacher before this job. Um, and in between these two, I lived in Vancouver, Canada and was um, doing math and reading intervention for kids and adults with Down syndrome. So a lot of very targeted sort of um, behavior characteristics um, were tackled within that education piece. Um, so I'm bringing a little bit of expertise from that, a lot of passionate advocacy alongside um, the rest of you, and um, just a willingness always to learn from our athletes about how um, we can better serve our community. So throughout this uh, presentation, I encourage you to write down some questions. Um, ideally, we'll save more in-depth questions for the end, but if at any time during this presentation, you are just confused by something I'm saying or I misspeak, please um, interrupt me or put it in the chat and Aaron and Jenny will interrupt me. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, for the next about 23 minutes, I will present and then knowing that you guys are each other's greatest assets and resources, we just want to give you guys the time to talk to each other and really work through, you know, the skills that you guys are already bringing to your own individual teams and give you the tools that you need to share those together. Um, and then about the last 10 minutes or so, we'll do just a group discussion wrap up since we'll break out into uh, rooms and make sure that we can share some of the very useful tips and tricks that we're sure you guys will share with each other. Uh, overall, the message in this entire training is that we are all, we're all people, athletes included. These strategies to improve learning apply to ourselves too. These are not 
I would not say they're all strategies specific to individuals with ID. They apply to ourselves, our children, our partners in life, our coworkers. Um, these are ways that anyone can improve learning or improve communication or learn about motivation. And we just happen to be delivering the content through the scope of our athletes. Uh, so I really okay. encourage you to think about these skills and how this information applies to your everyday lives. Um, and of course, uh, if you can focus on maybe one athlete that you really struggle to communicate with, or maybe one athlete who you really want to motivate this upcoming season and try to apply some of this new knowledge to that, the more personal we can make this, um, the better. So thank you all again for sending in your individual questions. I will do my best to get through as many of them as possible in the next 21 minutes, um, but we will certainly hope to do a part two if there are a lot of unanswered questions. So moving forward, our objective is going to be to identify practical methods for enhancing athlete experience and sport confidence through athlete-centered coaching strategies. Uh, so this will be done through uh, learning about motivation, effective overall communication, and teaching some quick strategies for improved learning. So talking through motivation, um, I would say right now is a very unique uh, situation. Everyone is struggling with motivation. I mean, going to work every day, you need motivation to do that. Working out, for those of us that are good about that, myself not included, that requires a lot of motivation and overall, the ability to be motivated is to work hard and persevere amidst adversity or challenges, whatever those may be. Um, it's sometimes it's difficult. So our athletes and ourselves, everyone could be included by, or could be motivated by extrinsic rewards or intrinsic rewards. Um, extrinsic being those external things, those tactile things, um, ribbons, medals, sometimes food. I would absolutely put food in that category. Um, intrinsic rewards would be something more like um, accomplishing a personal best, maybe beating, uh, beating a team that they hadn't beaten before that they know is um, competing at a higher level, right? Those are going to be those intrinsic rewards. Um, and motivation is not always tied to those tactile things, as we know. Um, overall, though, we all have different motivations. Thinking about our own personal lives, Sometimes we're motivated, for example, to clean the dishes in the sink because otherwise we can't cook dinner. Um, or, you know, if we don't clean those things up, then we have our own motivations to that. There'll be bugs, it'll be dirty, whatever it may be. Um, we as individuals have the ability to connect our motivations to what we need to do. Whereas athletes or individuals with ID don't always have the ability to connect those things, to know that something is motivating to them because it's related to them individually and personally, right? So it's kind of our job as coaches to learn more about our athletes, learn what it is that makes them tick. What are they interested in? Really little things that you can grasp onto. Do they love the color blue versus the color red? Um, do they watch a lot of Hamilton the musical at home. Um, what are those tiny little things that you know motivate them outside of sports that you can use to your advantage within practice? Um, so I really want you guys to think about those things. A lot of the questions that you sent in, and thank you again for those of you that sent, um, sent in questions, a lot of them were around motivation. Um, just to list some, motivation to do the sport properly, uh, motivation to get athletes to achieve virtual results, very difficult one. Um, keeping athletes motivated throughout the whole season, it's, you know, it can be a very long season sometimes. Um, and then motivation for the fitness portion of practice, which I know um, a lot of coaches struggle through. And I will say for that one, we are going to have a follow-up coach's corner to address the topic specifically of fitness at practice. So I'll table that one. Um, but in terms of motivation to do the sport properly or to keep athletes motivated for the rest of the season, it's very individualized. Um, again, think about those things that make athletes work hard. Uh, going back to the Hamilton example, if one athlete loves Hamilton or if you've got a big group that love Hamilton the musical, maybe your end of the season celebration is 
watching the musical all together on Zoom, right? That's something that's very individually motivating for maybe one or 10 athletes, but it's a social engagement that gets them all together. And that's one thing that they look forward to at the very end of the season, right? It gets them through. Um, and thinking about what generally motivates athletes in the real season, what is it that keeps them going and how can we get that done virtually? Um, and I would say, I'm sure as we brainstorm all together, you guys will have a lot of ideas for each other for that one. So I don't wanna take away from that um, experience. So going on to effective communication, uh, you guys all already know that your athletes communicate in such a variety of ways. Um, speech and language communication needs certainly in mind. Try to remember that athletes very often understand more than what they can communicate back to you. Um, whether it's because it's a feeling of discomfort or not just not knowing how to communicate that response back to you. Uh, communicating more often and repeating respectfully uh, the things that you're trying to say will ensure more understanding and of course keep our athletes um, more engaged. And relating this to motivation, you kind of want to apply a similar thought process with our athletes. If someone's having trouble focusing on their own improvement or on the task at hand, think about what motivates that person individually and help them make that connection. If you're teaching explicitly how to dribble with one hand and you know that that athlete loves LeBron James, show them a video of LeBron James dribbling with one hand. It could be as simple as that. Um, if, you're, if an athlete communicates more efficiently or is more motivated by videos, take a video of them, of them themselves, bouncing the ball really well with one hand. They'll watch that video over and over and over again. Um, those are just really small things that you can do to communicate effectively using the ways that they best um, understand. So this visual is something that came from SOI and it's kind of, it's, I like how it's easily, um, it's just easy to read and something you could kind of keep like in a coach's book that you have if you need a reminder if you're having a day thinking, oh my gosh, nothing I say is coming out clearly. These are good reminders to just be concise, um, be consistent. Switching up directions is going to obviously cause confusion. So, you know, be consistent in the directions you give. Of course, being clear, um, command oriented and concrete. Um, a lot of our athletes just function and learn better with concrete examples rather than things that you have to visualize, right? Show them a concrete example instead of um, having them picture it in their head. So these are some examples again that came from SOI uh, in terms of verbal communication strategies. One of the questions that uh, one of you guys sent in was are there only a few athletes who learn by verbal cues. So in my experience, this is going to be varied. In general, we all respond to some sort of verbal cue, right? Um, everyone, for, again, for everyone it varies, but different things stick for different people. So some athletes might hear one command or one um, direction, whereas other athletes won't hear that because it just doesn't click. So through trial and error, you'll have to try different things, right? If you know one athlete responds to dribble the ball, then you'll have to use that for that group. Whereas another athlete might respond to something else a little bit better, but everyone really does respond to some sort of verbal cue, but combine it. If people respond to verbal cue and an action or a whistle, combine those things together so that you can really get the most efficient form of communication for everybody. But I would say don't be afraid to, you know, try these strategies given from SOI first. So again, being clear and concise, um, using that consistent terminology instead of switching it up on them, um, and repeating directions if necessary. I know it can be very frustrating at times to feel like you're repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again whether we're talking about athletes or we're talking about coworkers or children at home or partners at home, it can be incredibly frustrating to repeat um, the same thing over.
but knowing that repetition is an actual strategy for learning for a lot of our athletes um, with intellectual disabilities. Again, using those keywords, um, try to remember what those keywords are and you can use visual strategies to your advantage here. If you have specific keywords, put them up somewhere so that people can see them. If that's a big poster that you're putting up or like I think about it as like a, on a football field, right? Sometimes they hold up different pictures. If you can use keywords that you put on a poster or a picture that also serves as that word, um, that could be something that triggers the acknowledgement to follow a certain direction for some athletes. And it's a very easy thing to do. Um, super easy change to make. Uh, focusing attention is a big one. Assuming that someone's paying attention to you just because they're looking at you. Um, again, this is not just athletes, this is everyone included. I know I could give everyone eye contact and they can assume I'm listening, but really I'm in la-la land and thinking about my dinner. So making sure that when you're speaking to someone focusing attention and, you know, giving some sort of direction or having someone repeat back. Again, that ties into checking for understanding. Um, instead of saying, you got it, and they say, yep, what, what do they, you know, what do they got? You got what? Um, thinking about being really specific when you check in for that understanding. Um, show me exactly where your position will be. Show me how you dribble that ball with one hand. Um, it'll go a lot further than just saying, you know, did you get it? Did you understand? And eliciting a yes or no uh, answer. Moving on to visual, um, and I'll touch on the sensory question as well that someone had asked me. Um, some visual communication strategies, of course, are using your hands, feet, whatever, facial gestures um, to cue certain things. And of course, demonstrating often. I know I'm a person that, I'm a, an incredibly visual person and I need to see one example first before I'm able to do that. Um, keep it in mind that a lot of our athletes are going to be very visual as well. And this goes back to that strategy of maybe taking a video um, of athletes who can watch themselves doing something correctly over and over again. Take their phone, have them demonstrate it well and video them doing it well. And then they can watch themselves practice doing the same thing over and over again. Um, but of course, making sure that it's right in the video that you take too. Um, and clarifying boundaries. So marking things super clearly, use different color lines. Again, something as small as if, athlete, if an athlete doesn't like blue, but they love red, make it red if you can. It's, it's a very easy um, change to make. And of course, um, making sure that someone understands that, right? show me where the out of bounds line is, show me where your foot can go, show me where your foot cannot go, um, making sure that uh, we're very clear there. So someone asked for an array of ideas to assist in communicating with individuals who have sensory and auditory sensitivities. Um, this is going to be very age sensitive, I would say. All of us have some sort of sensory needs, um, whether it's food textures, um, voice levels, noise levels, um, crowded spaces. We all have different needs when it comes to sensory, um, when it comes to sensory necessities. Um, so I'd say that might be one that could be brainstormed again within these small groups because it is very age sensitive, right? If you have you know, child athletes versus adult athletes have very different accommodations to sensory needs. You could give a child something, um, you know, like one of those um, things that you put in your mouth that they're tactile with their teeth, but you couldn't give that to an adult as easily as you could a child. So they're, they vary so much um, that I would say, let's follow up with that individually, or maybe come up with some examples uh, that we all could use in the breakout groups. Moving on with visual, again, color shapes, markers, directional signs, make them big, make them bold. And again, that video modeling, um, creating a short video, whether it's you doing it and sharing it, or again, a lot of our athletes, and I'll say specifically those with Down syndrome are motivated by seeing themselves. Um, so if you can take a video of themselves doing 
doing what it is that you'd like them to do, they will be very motivated to watch that video. I can, I can guarantee that. Uh, kinesthetic, of course, keep it moving. That's what we're all about. Planning activities where there's minimal time waiting for a turn, right? Keeping things going. Um, and here, again, coming from SOI, when lines have three or fewer athletes, there's increased focus and more repetitions, right? Waiting and they're thinking through what it is they're going to do next, rather than if there's 10 people in line, there, there's just kind of more time to kill but leaving them the ability to focus on what their next step is um, in order to keep it moving would be really helpful. So talking through communication, these sound like probably super common sense things and really they are, um, but these reminders never hurt. And sometimes I think we find ourselves communicating in such a haste that we forget a lot of these things. Um, if we're in a hurry or at a competition or you know, having to wrap it up through a quick practice. Um, some of these basic rules of communication that obviously we would want afforded to us, we wanna keep in mind as we're communicating with athletes. Um, of course, speaking slowly and with intention, for those of you that are super fast speakers out there, maybe remind yourself to slow down a bit sometimes. Um, a huge one that I talked to like our young professionals board about and sort of our younger uh, volunteers is communicating in an age-appropriate tone, keeping in mind that our adult athletes are adults. Um, some of them are 50 years old with jobs and partners and driver's licenses and people will say, oh, they're so cute, um, which is not a way that I would want to be referred to when I'm 50 years old with a family and a job and a driver's license. Um, so just thinking that through and, um, of course, giving athletes time to process questions and respond fully. Um, when we're checking for understanding, give the time that they need to process through what it is that you had just said. Um, the maintaining of eye contact is not comfortable for everybody, but for those that you do know, communicate more efficiently with eye contact, of course, maintaining that. Um, and being an active listener. Sometimes, again, our athletes understand a lot more than they're able to communicate because they're not communicating it in the way that we are used to. So knowing and understanding that they might communicate um, back to us differently than we're used to hearing. And of course, giving someone, posturing yourself towards that person, you know, try and give them your full attention if possible, um, just as you would want someone to give to you. Um, and again, moving with, moving forward with different lines of communication, if someone is nonverbal, um, or speech is unclear, it's, it's kind of awkward to say, sorry, what was that? Five different times, right? It feels a little bit like you're being kind of rude or disrespectful and um, that's just kind of the lay of the land with some of our athletes that have speech impairments or are completely nonverbal. Um, just remind yourself that there are so many more ways to communicate, one being our phones that everyone has with us all the time. Take out your phone, Write, um, type it out, have them type it out, write it on a piece of paper and pen. Um, there are so many ways to communicate more clearly other than just verbal, um, other than just verbally. So I say, this is honestly the one I resort to the most and it almost always does the trick because all of us have one and all of us have it very close to us, if not on us. Um, and again, just keeping in mind those very basic rules of that you would want afforded to you um, explaining to someone that you don't understand, not just pretending like, oh yeah, I got it and turning and walking away. Um, I know that's a very frustrating thing for me. If I think I just communicated with someone very clearly and they said, yeah, yeah, I got it. And then they turned around and did not do at all what we talked about. Um, you wouldn't want to do that to an athlete who's trying to communicate that to you. Um, so just thinking about, again, those same exact things that you would want communicated um, to you as an individual. And I think probably everyone knows person first language um, and not labels, uh, person with autism instead of autistic person. Although I will say, I recently read that specifically within autism, some people do prefer to say autistic. So when in doubt, ask, you know, we can shift easily. If someone prefers to say I am autistic instead of I am a person with autism, that's a very easy um, adjustment to make. Um, and again, asking those open-ended questions, not, did you get it? Yes or no? 
much. Tell me, you know, tell me what it is that we just talked about that you do get. Giving them the ability and more meaningful way to engage in communication with you other than just a quick yes or no answer. Um, and as we all do, as you guys all do, because you're amazing coaches, um, focus on the athlete's abilities instead of their disabilities. If they're having a lot of trouble with one specific skill, what do you know they can do? What is it that they can do within that skill and work from there? Instead of just automatically assuming, well, we're never gonna get there, um, you know, strength, use that strength-based approach. Where can we start? Where will they automatically experience success? And then have the confidence to build up to what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and then I know Jenny sent out this resource earlier today. I would highly, highly encourage you all to take a look at it. Um, this has some more uh, specific ways that you guys can kind of conquer potential behavior barriers. So take a look at this after. Um, and I want to be very timely, so we have one more minute. So um, some really, really quick practical strategies to implement or remind yourself of, I would say, is ask before you assume. Um, before thinking that you need to start with this specific direction because, um, you know, athletes really need that, ask. You know, do you remember where we left off? How are you doing with this skill? Um, they might be further than you think. They might not be as far as you think. So giving them the autonomy and independence to indicate to you as coaches where they're at um, will really encourage independence. Um, and of course, put yourself in their shoes. What would you want if it were you? If an athlete's having a really hard day, would you want some space? Would you want someone to push and challenge you? Um, just try and kind of put yourself in their shoes first. Uh, allow for time, give time to process, give time to understand, learn, and then apply. Um, we have, most of us have the innate ability to learn something quickly and then put it to use right away. Uh, that's not always the case for individuals with varying abilities. It takes time to listen, then to process the new information, then to understand that new information, and then apply it. That's a very long drawn out process at times, whereas for us, it's just a quick learn and go. Um, so reminding ourselves of that, and of course, encouraging as much independence as possible. It's beneficial for you and beneficial for our athletes, of course. So here's some additional questions that I thought we wouldn't get to, um, but we're one minute over and I really wanna give you guys uh, the time during breakout rooms to discuss these things amongst yourselves. So uh, breakout rooms are going to be about 20 minutes and I would love um, if you guys could kind of focus on these two questions. So number one, thinking about a time when you experience difficulty communicating with um, a specific athlete. What tools did you use to overcome those communication barriers? Um, you guys are all phenomenal coaches. Again, some of you have been with us for a year, 10 years plus. Um, you all have some incredible skills that are very valuable to share with each other. And then number two, thinking about one athlete on your team. Relating this to motivation, what do you know about them? What do you know that they love? If it's a color, if it's a food, like tiny, tiny thing. Um, what do they, what really motivates them? Uh, and how can you utilize that? How can you utilize what they love to motivate them during practice, outside of practice, for a whole season, virtually? Um, kind of brings brainstorm amongst yourselves uh, during this breakout room. Okay, so I just wanted to see if in your discussions, um, anyone really wanted to share something that really stood out to them, whether it's something you just learned from a fellow coach, um, something that you will try as a result of this webinar and you want to share, um, or something that you're just currently doing and you found really helpful and would like to suggest to other coaches. I will share what Deb and Kathy talked about, and they touched on the two different scenarios about communication, but it was, um, it, they both tied in each other. Um, they both talked about how um, having more time with their athletes kind of broke down the communication barriers because they got to know them, got to know the cues that, um, that those athletes had versus 
um, when they first met the athlete, like Kathy talked about, she worked up um, ways of where they can sign what they were saying. And then she got to, to know the athletes a little bit better. If she couldn't understand what they were saying, then they had a sign that they can, that she can communicate them with. And Deb said the same thing about lowering the athletes a little bit longer. Uh, she knew their cues. She knew, she knew what, um, what kind of motivated them. So having that longer communication with them helped them out a lot. That's great. Thanks, guys. Uh, anyone else want to share something? Well, I'll share something that uh, someone in our group had talked about just um, in general, how even when, as we're talking about motivation and finding the individual motivator for each person, it's, it's, it's a hard, it's easier said than done. Um, you guys serve such a wide variety of athletes and getting down to the nitty gritty of each individual is again, not something that you can just snap your fingers and have happen. Um, there's so much that you guys have going on in one practice and on one team and um, giving yourself the time and patience to really just try and connect with each athlete one at a time is, um, it's a lot. So um, what you guys do is great. So just wanted to share that. Hi, thank you. Anybody gonna offer something? Sure. Um, I was just gonna say that um, I think one thing we want to keep in mind with our athletes is to try to progress from the extrinsic re rewards to the intrinsic rewards. And sometimes that has to do with how long you've known them, how old they are, that kind of stuff. But that, um, you know, to try and get away from the extrinsic motivators like the awards and the uh, food and that kind of stuff um, to move into. I like the comment you made about, you know, we've never played that well against that team before, or, you know, we beat that team and we've never beaten them before, that type of thing, where as opposed to just saying, oh, yeah, we're going to get a gold medal or whatever. Yeah, that's great. And it tells you so much more about um, what it is that makes each individual tick is learning, um, you know, what intrinsically motivates them for sure. Um, well, lastly, I uh, wanted to thank everyone, of course, um, for your time and commitment to all of our athletes and the mission of Special Olympics Colorado. Um, and just think through the fact that during this time, I think a lot of us have experienced some sort of regression, whether it's in the skills we have, uh, motiv motivations that we normally have. I think everything is sort of at a halt. Um, and certainly our athletes or individuals with ID more easily experience regression of skills. And so just um, know that we're here to support you and um, your time and patience is uh, really very, very, very much appreciated. Um, if you ever have any more questions or want to talk about anything further, um, I come from the realm of education and some specific behavioral um, techniques. I know I think the plan is to do another part two that is specific to behavioral de-escalation. So um, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that in a different time, um, but you can always reach out to me with any uh, questions or comments or of course improvements, please.